Hello everybody and welcome back to our four-part boss ranking remaster of Blood Souls. Or is it Blood Shadow Souls now? I know, I know, it's looking more and more by the day like Sekiro isn't going to be too similar to Souls, but let's not mourn what we're losing and instead celebrate what the mastermind behind this series we adore has in store. And of course today we can continue to celebrate the bosses of old in a remaster of my choices for the easiest bosses in the Souls series. Admittedly breaking down the easiest bosses is really, really hard. After looking at it, I was surprised at how many throwaway bosses there are in the franchise. <coughs> Dark Souls- <coughs> I stared at a list of over 30 bosses for hours trying to piece out what the easiest to the easiest are. After all that brain bending work, I believe I've broken out the cream of the pathetic crop. Keep in mind, as I mentioned in the Hardest Bosses video, I'm taking this list from the perspective of a veteran with every advantage at their disposal. As if I'd need it. Without further ado, here are my top 10 easiest bosses in the Soul series. Number 10, Moonlight Butterfly Dark Souls Remastered. Moonlight Butter doesn't fly, you idiot. Moonlight Butter doesn't fly, you idiot. Sadly, sometimes our memes are merely dreams, because all this fluttering butter stick does is fly! It's Dark Souls Prepare to Fly Edition! The wait for this bitch bug to come down makes me prepare to cry edition! Seriously though, there's nothing to this fight at all. It flies around for what feels like days while shooting you with easy to dodge magic. Even if you do get hit by it, just heal up because it doesn't follow up all that quickly. I'm sure you don't need any tips, but my advice is to leave the butterbug for later in your playthrough because it only rewards you with a handful of souls and an ember that I've never found useful. This will make it so when she finally does land, you can kill her in one go. Otherwise, you'll suffer through what feels like an eternity of waiting for her to descend again. Of course, if you have a range build, the fight is even more pathetic. Just shoot in between her attacks and you'll be golden. I will admit in comparison to what's to come, Come, the boss can't give you trouble if you aren't too good at dodging the magic, and if you come here super early, it could wear out your Estus if you can't knock her out in one landing. That gives her a slight edge over what's to come. Number 9, Deacons of the Deep, Dark Souls 3. If you've seen my previous list, don't think this means the Deacons have gotten any harder. No, 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 no. I've just got a few bosses who I think deserve a higher shout out, and that's enough to push them down a few spots. But we all know the drill. Hit the shiny red Deacon five times and then beat the Pope to a pulp. The only thing that ever made this fight any kind of challenging was not realizing what the mechanic was. But even in my first playthrough, it wasn't rocket science to piece it together. Hey, I should probably attack the glowing red guy. Once you figure it out, this fight is a matter of dodging a bunch of passive wizards that would rather stumble around at the speed of a tortoise with their head in the clouds and put up any kind of fight. I will at least give the fatties in the second phase credit for the irritating force spell and mention that if you get hit by the perfect storm of a bunch of them attacking at once, they could one-shot you. And of course, I have to live with the fact that I played uncharacteristically passive in my first playthrough and I died to curse as a result. But the idea of these factors being a danger to a veteran is non-existent. In reality, this boss is nothing more than a pebble in the road on your journey. Number 8, Witches of Hemwick, Bloodborne. Speaking of pebbles in the road and defenseless mages, we come to this dreadfully non-difficult duo. Just as with the Deacons of the Deep, once you know how to handle the witches, they pose almost no threat at all. You can actually find both witches in the same spot at the start of every single fight. Even with mid-game damage, you can melt half of both of their health bars before they have time to do so much as blink. The best strategy is to whittle down their health back and forth to avoid the second phase, which isn't difficult per se, but you do run the risk of getting grabbed by the witches. Even if you did, it's often not enough damage to kill you, and you'll have ample time to heal. The only thing that puts pressure on you are the mad ones in the arena, but the majority of the time they simply wander around ignoring you while you slaughter their masters. If you really want to make it easy, use a bold hunter's mark and go spend all of your insight at the hunter's dream. If you come back to this fight with zero insight, there will be no mad ones at all. But that's completely unnecessary. The final nail in the witch's coffin is that they're optional. Granted, they do guard a very useful item in the rune tool, but you could choose to come here once your weapon is fully upgraded with powerful blood gems, making the fight all the easier. No matter when I come here in the game, the fight is almost always comically easy. Number 7, High Lord Wolnir, Dark Souls 3. Here's a boss that isn't optional. That said, it's very easy if you know what you're doing to get a plus 7 weapon before you ever even come to it. Well, in this playthrough, I decided to kill Frida to low level for shits and giggles and use the Ring City to get a plus 10 weapon. I'm pretty sure somewhere down there, Wolnir's knees are shaking. While I did the high upgrade for the fun of it, it makes little difference other than ending the fight quickly. For starters, you can get many hits on the first bracelet without even waking the Vape Lord. Unless you're using a far weaker weapon than you should be at this point in the mid-game, it's a guaranteed break. From there, you can break the second bracelet before he even has time to attack again if you're fast enough, and even if he does attack, it's not like he's all that dangerous. He doesn't do much damage at all! He can call in reinforcements and pull out a sword, but he does it so rarely and is usually dead long before that, so it's hardly relevant. The only reason he didn't find himself on the previous iteration of this list is because I used to be an overly aggressive fool that died to his poison. That poison will obliterate your health bar, but if you have any sense of patience, you'll never find yourself in it, leaving Wolnir as easy prey. 
Number 6, Prowling Magus and Congregation, Dark Souls 2. We're finally getting to that borderline. That being the bottom half of the list where the bosses actually put up some semblance of a fight. Prowling Magus and Congregation is nothing more than a handful of rejected basic bitches thrown into a small chapel to cosplay as a boss. If there's any challenge whatsoever in this fight, it's hitting those ankle-biting clowns on the floor. You might get hit by magic if you're careless, but even then it's easy to heal up before you're at any risk. Just like with the Deacons, it feels like the only possible way you could be in any danger in this fight is if you got hit by the perfect storm of attacks and chose not to retreat and heal. The pews in the church make it easy to run around and effectively crowd control everything, but it's not all that necessary. You really just can beat down on everything, take a moment to heal, and go back in for some more whooping. This doesn't even feel like a boss. It feels like a standard room of enemies in Dark Souls that happens to be a little overcrowded. Chopping it down to size and moving on is something that could hardly make you even break a sweat. Number 5, Celestial Emissary, Bloodborne. As I previously mentioned, we've reached the point where enemies really won't even bother hitting you anymore. At least with Celestial Emissary, it's not for lack of trying. These blue goobers will run at you wildly, giving off the impression that they're gonna pose some sort of threat, but in reality, all they do is line up for you to chop them all down at once. The best part is, by running at you, they give away the real boss's identity because he's the wimp hiding in the back. When you go teach him a lesson on what it means to use minions as death fodder for your cowardice, he'll make an attempt to go phase two. But being the veterans that we are, we're prepared, and it's no hard feat to kill him before he has a chance to do anything. If you came to Upper Cathedral Ward earlier in the game, I could see how this boss could end up being a little bit harder, but there's no reason to do that considering the only thing that they block entry to is Abritas' chamber, and you certainly don't want to do that with pitiful damage. Ultimately, I think even in that case, the Blue Goobers would still be the laughing stock of Bloodborne. Number 4, Covetous Demon, Dark Souls 2. As we continue on, the bosses we reach put less and less resistance up against you. I understand Covetous Demon's lore as a man so obsessed with Mythos Beauty that he ate boundless amounts of food as a way of showcasing his dying admiration. Here's what makes no sense to me, though. Was Earthen Peak some land that celebrated eating competitions above all else? Where the men who reigned victorious were treated as gods amongst men that were the object of all women's desires? Well, if it's not that, then I can't imagine why this unsightly blob thought it was a good idea to gorge himself until he became the picture of gluttony. That's only gonna start to make you more lonely. The reason I'm taking time to paint this picture for you is that it shows why he can't do much in the fight. Have you ever seen a thousand pound man get up to win a heavyweight boxing championship? Yeah, I haven't either. So I get why his attacks revolve around slow, predictable movements that are mostly throwing his immense body weight around. But due to his stature, his tells have the speed you'd expect, his damage is impressive, but nothing you can't heal through between blows, and frankly, this fight will be over in 10 seconds anyway. You know what's the most mind-boggling? We still got three bosses remaining! Number 3, Agitator, Demon Souls. From one lardo to another, the Agitimicator is just like the covetous demon, but somehow manages to aspire to have tells that aren't just slower, they are the slowest in the entire series. Sometimes bosses do have moves that have big wind-ups. This is to let the player know, hey, a big move is coming, better get far out of the way or prepare to dodge. And sure, the logic is the same here, but the way this lump pulls back his sword, you'd think he was moving in slow motion. I think he might actually be able to orbit his planet's Size belly in the time it takes him to rev up his sword. And that's it. That's his shtick. Other than hitting his obvious weak spot and knocking him into his next life by smacking his bird head. If you were less experienced, then perhaps you would try staying on the upper levels, or maybe you'd have trouble figuring out the mechanic of damaging his wound to get access to his only weak spot. But well, we're talking about experienced players here. And honestly, even if we weren't, it's not all that hard to figure out in between the massive swings that he takes. Such a joke, but the final two bits are just a bit more comical. Number two, Pinwheel Dark Souls Remastered. But wait! There's more! Ha <laughs> I bet some of you are furiously typing in the comments how wrong I am for not having Pinwheel in his rightful place as the easiest boss in the existence of the universe. And I'm sure some of you noticed a clever rule omission from my first list that would clue you into the new top tadpole monster. You'll get that reference in a minute. Look, Pinwheel is unquestionably one of the easiest bosses I've faced in any game. I've been told many times that the reason he's so easy is that players fight him later in their playthrough post San Orlando. That's a reasonable assertion. For me, by the time I make it to San Orlando, I've already got a fully upgraded weapon. Granted, in my playthrough of the remaster, I had a fully upgraded weapon before I even rang my first bell, but the point stands. For new players, they wouldn't have this knowledge, and FromSoft expected players to fight Pinwheel earlier in the game. Fair assumption, that is, unless you consider how awful it is to make it past the skeletons in the beginning of the game. Dark Souls has a natural way of telling you where to go by making things too difficult, pushing you in a different direction. Of course, I ignored that warning and went to fight Pinwheel anyway, and he's just as easy when you fight him early, believe me. He stands there and lets you beat on him, and then he flies around with his copies trying to confuse you, but they don't. And even if they did have some super special scary attack they were building up to, he's always dead before anything like that could ever happen. Pinwheel truly is the epitome of anti-challenge, but there's one final boss that takes the cake. And the number one easiest boss in the entire Souls series, True King Alant, Demon Souls. Last time I said I wasn't going to include True King Alant because he's a shoe in for the easiest boss, but isn't that kind of the point of these lists anyway? Even if it's predictable, that doesn't make it any less true for me. And I'm sure those of you who've never played Demon Souls are still typing feverishly in the comments how Pinwheel's giant dad is going to be coming for my booty. Well, let me tell you, booty smacking is not a necessity. 
necessity here. You can legitimately stand in this tadpole sewage monster's face and let it hit you while you hit him back. Seriously, just stand there and whack away and stop to heal every now and again. Of course, this makes sense just like Covetous Demon with the lore. Alana's taken a huge fall from grace due to his dealings with the old one. But this list isn't about quality, it's about ease. And honestly, even if this is just a piece of lore fodder, it's one of the saddest excuses for any semblance of a challenge I can remember in any game that I have ever played. But of course, that's just my opinion. Tell me what bosses in the Soul series you curb stomp with ease in the comments below. The Hollow Knight Demodathon will be concluding here shortly, so be on the lookout for new rankings to close out that marathon. We still got the best and worst bosses in the Soul series to remaster too, and with the Nier Automata Demodathon underway, it's only a matter of time till we're talking waifu. Be sure to subscribe for those videos and more, and leave a like if you enjoyed the video. It means a lot to me to know you're enjoying the content. Thank you all for watching today, much love to you, and I'll see you in the next video.